people doing extraordinary things to help others. If he didn't do what he did, we would have died. Heroic acts that have sometimes meant the difference between life and death. And he was just crying, don't let me die, don't let me die, save me, save me. Amazing acts of courage. It was just a natural reaction. This guy needs help. Captured on dash cams, CCTV, and mobile phones. Incredible stories from the UK. They put his life at risk just to save me. And across the world. Mayday, mayday, mayday. All the people that assisted with my rescues that day are my heroes. We genuinely owe our lives to him. Today on Saved on Camera. A Taurus keen to try hang gliding is left hanging on for dear life. We got lined up. As soon as my feet left the ground, gravity just took me straight down. He soon discovers the reason. Something was not right. I fell completely downward. He wasn't attached to the hang glider. And we were getting closer to the ground, and I was losing grip. Waiting for him to land, his wife had no idea he was in dire trouble. He looked up to the sky to see where my husband was going to land. My pilot told me that he had already landed and needs to go to the hospital. In the UK, a woman targeted by car thieves is saved by two broomstick-wielding heroes. So the woman is screaming without thinking, call the my other colleague, come around and say, come outside. The lady, she was on the floor, and the two guys trying to rob the car. In the UK, a much-loved family pet disappears on his daily walk. I couldn't hear him rustling in a bush. I couldn't hear him panting. Getting himself stuck in a narrow pipe. But after three days, his chances of coming out alive are slim. I arranged where we could dig away from where the dog was trapped in the hope that it was still alive. And off the southeast coast of America, a cargo ship has capsized with 24 people still on board. My mind was just reeling. Am I having a bad dream? The Coast Guard is on its way, but a rescue will not be easy. As we approached the scene, I could start making the outline of the ship. I thought, oh my gosh, this is really happening. A couple on holiday in Switzerland have a hang gliding experience that leaves one of them hanging on for dear life. If I lose my grip, I'm a goner. There's no way I'm going to survive this. He told me that was the closest to death he had ever come. Chris and Gail Gerksey from Florida have been married for 27 years. They share a hunger for adventure. We both have an equal passion for being outdoors and, and trying new things. Me and Gail have been in uh, many adventures. Every time we travel, we, we like to do something a little different on one of the days. Some vacations are fine just laying on the beach, but other times we like to do something a little adventurous, jet skiing, snowmobiling. We've been up on a hot air balloon. Normally we've been ziplining. We've ziplined in many places. Chris is a bit more of a daredevil than I am. For my 40th birthday, uh, she had purchased me a skydiving excursion, which was really cool. I don't jump out of airplanes. Um, <laughs> the couple were looking forward to their next adventure to Switzerland. First stop was the alpine village of Interlaken, a mecca for thrill seekers, and there was one activity the couple both had their eye on. I did hear about the hang gliding um, in Interlaken, and doing my research, it seemed like the best place to do it. She showed me, and I was all in. It looked, it looked very cool. We were excited. From everything we've seen, it just looked like a beautiful place. We were excited to get here, and we were excited to try hand gliding for our first time and go tour the country. Despite some last minute jitters from Gail, the hike up the mountain to the takeoff spot blew them both away. 
I was a bit nervous about going hang gliding for the first time. Once we got up the mountain and you could see the beautiful views and everything, I just decided it was going to be gorgeous and to go for it. The visibility was awesome. You could see across the valley to the next mountain, both lakes and interlock, and it was just perfect flying conditions. We were really, really psyched to go. First, though, the all-important briefing from the pilots. The instructors were great. They seemed to really know how to make us feel at ease and um, go through each of the steps on how we were going to take off and land. The pilots were walking us through every step and uh, hooking up, you know, putting our harnesses on, and they were explaining everything as they were going. We practiced a couple times standing next to each other and doing the run. You're supposed to run side by side until your feet leave the ground. Everything seemed to be organized and safe, and they were um, very assuring. You know, my wife got hooked up to her glider. Gail took off with her pilot ready. She left first. I think I looked back before we took off, and I just said, I'll see you later. <laughs> With his wife safely in the air, it was Chris's turn for takeoff. He walked over to the launch area, and uh, we uh, we lined up, and it was like, are you ready? Go, go, go. And then we ran until our feet left the ground. But things were about to go terribly wrong. Something was not right with my hookup. I fell completely downward. I was supposed to fly right next to the pilot. Gravity just took me straight down. I had to really just grab onto anything I could. Figured out that I wasn't attached to the hand glider. Later, Chris will need to use every bit of his resolve to survive the mid-air emergency. If I lose my grip, I'm a goner. There's no way I'm going to survive this. In the UK, a woman is under attack at a petrol station by two men who are determined to steal their car. But her attack is being captured on CCTV, and two members of staff aren't prepared to just stand by and watch. Friends Cameron and Rizalit work at their local petrol station in Birmingham, and it's more than just a job to them. The people who are working here, we are like, it's like a family. Me and Rizalit work together, it's more than three years now. Oh. Oh. <laughs> okay, thank you. He's a very kind with the customer, with me, with everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day. Working as a team, he's a very nice person, honest, and uh, very brave. But what they didn't know is that this bravery would be put to the test when they were on an early morning shift. I was working inside. He was working on till. I was working in the office. Outside, on the forecourt, a customer was filling her car with fuel. All was quiet as the customer made her way inside to pay. Outside was really quiet. So it was dark as well. But as the woman made her way back to her car, two menacing figures appeared and ran towards her. Within seconds, she was thrown to the ground and her car was moments from being taken. Hearing the woman's screams, Rizalit was alerted to the unfolding drama outside. So when the woman uh, is screaming uh, and quickly, without thinking, I called uh, uh, my other colleague, come around and say, come outside. Come outside, it definitely means something happened outside in the forecourt. As they ran to help the woman, they grabbed whatever was to hand on the way. The colleagues made their way out as fast as possible and wasted no time in confronting the attackers. The lady, she was on the floor, and the two guys trying to rob the car. With little thought for their own safety, they ran to the woman's rescue. 
I never uh, think uh, anything they have, a uh, knife, anything, because I haven't got time to think. We didn't think about our own safety, because we, we are thinking about that lady. But could they help the woman and save their car before the thieves escaped? So I shout, say, get off, woman. So when they saw them coming with broomstick, they run. They left the ladies and run. With the carjackers long gone, Rizlet and Cameron made their way back to check the woman was OK. She was uh, crying and was really shocked and scared. So I asked uh, they took anything from you. She told us uh, basically they want the keys. It was really, you know, that is very shocking. They were very dangerous. Still a little bit scary as well, because police, you can't catch them. But these friends have no regrets and would do the same again. The lady was in danger, so I thought my job was to save the woman. The aim of my life is to help the uh, other people as well. If, if anything happens again, so I will do again. My family, they proud me. And it's good for us, you know, when, when the people are saying, oh, yes, you are a hero, you've done a great job. It's very nice for us. Off the coast of America, a cargo container carrying 4,000 cars and 24 crew members has capsized. My mind was just reeling. Am I having a bad dream? How many people are we talking about? And how are we going to get the people off the ship? And just when a rescue attempt is thought to have succeeded, the worst news was to come. To know that there remained uh, four people inside that ship uh, made me feel even worse. Brunswick, Georgia, on the southeast coast of America, is one of the busiest ports in the country when it comes to the import and export of cars. Each week, there's probably between uh, you know 10 to 12 of those vehicles uh, carriers moving in and out of the port of Brunswick. One such carrier is the Golden Ray, a 72,000 ton cargo ship bound for the Middle East. Just after midnight, it leaves Brunswick port with 4,000 new cars and 24 crew members on board. But after only 23 minutes at sea, disaster strikes. Captain John Reed was to oversee the rescue operation. I uh, received a call from the uh, captain of the port who told me he had received an initial report that a row-row vessel, a roll-on, roll-off vessel, had uh, capsized uh, on its way out of Brunswick. And my mind was just reeling. Am I, am I having a bad dream? How many people are we talking about, and how are we going to get the people off the ship? But this was no dream. This was a nightmare. With 24 lives at stake, Captain Reed dispatched his rescue teams. First to reach the scene is Pilot Lieutenant Rob Minow. As we approached the scene, I could start making the outline of the ship. I thought, oh my gosh, this is really happening. This is now a race to save lives. The Golden Ray is rapidly taken on water, could sink at any moment, and locating its 24 crewmen is proving a difficult task. We were able to establish a communication with the Coast Guard vessel and a tugboat on scene to assess where all the survivors were at. There was a lot of radio chatter going on, and it was really hard to identify locations of the uh, crew members on that ship. But a rapid rescue operation is imperative as by now, the Golden Ray is listing dangerously. We didn't know the stability of it, and you're looking at this boat that's 70 to 80 degrees on its side. So we decided we wanted to keep our swimmer connected to the aircraft on the hoist hook. Any maneuver by the rescue helicopter needs to be handled with precision. We were able to approach the first crew member from about 150 feet above the water, again, 70 to 80 feet above the uh, vessel. But every move Lieutenant Minnow makes could impact the stranded crew still on board the capsized craft. As we get lower, our rotor wash can impact the vessel and start to turn it. Naturally, with a 656-foot container ship, it's not going to affect it that much. 
However, for the people that were up on the uh, deck railing, less rotor wash that you're putting on then gives them a better chance of not losing any kind of footing or handhold. And lowering the rescue swimmer to the waiting survivors is proving difficult for the flight mechanic. He doesn't have night vision goggles on because it's difficult to hoist that way. But he's, you know, trying to position this swimmer almost 130 feet below the aircraft in the dark, in between multiple obstructions. Fortunately, our first person that we hoisted was on the starboard bridge wing, and they had a flashlight. Locating the first survivor is one thing. Hoisting him back to the helicopter is far more dangerous. Any kind of small movement you make up at altitude turns into a much larger swinging motion at the bottom. Our great concern was not to move the aircraft around as much. And when it's nighttime, it makes things pretty challenging. With the first successful rescue, the crew worked through the night to reach the others. But just as they thought they had everyone, they got the worst news. Four crew members were still on board. Worse still, they were trapped inside one of the most inaccessible parts of the ship, the engine room. Later, the fate of the remaining four crew hangs in the balance. We were tapping on the ship, and that was probably 10, 30, or 11 in the morning, and uh, we got no responses. In the UK, a Spaniel is trapped underground in a pipe. He's been there for three days, and his family are desperate to get him back. His whimpers are getting fainter, and the hope of him surviving with no food or water is getting more doubtful by the hour. I never wanted to give up on him, but every which way I turned, a door was closing. There was no way of finding him. Help is on the way from an unusual source, and they are pulling out all the stops to try and save him. I put my phone on, and the next thing I know, I've got an emergency call coming in, telling me there's a, a dog stuck, stuck up a pipe. So I thought, oh, God, what do I do here? The Athy family live in Oxfordshire. Mum Cat, Dad James, along with their three boys, and their six-year-old dog, Spencer or Spenny for short. Spenny is my Cocker Spaniel, who is rather crazy. He loves water, he loves running, he loves chasing, he loves being with his boys and his family. Come Spenny, let's go walkie. And for busy swimming teacher Kat, one of the nicest parts of the day is walking with Spencer. Come Spenny loves a walk. As soon as you say the word walk, at home, his ears will prick up, he will do that little head where he puts it to the side, and he's desperate to go. He loves to be off lead, he's running around, he's in and out of the bushes, his nose is to the ground sniffing everything. He just loves being outside. You good boy, come on. And luckily for them, one of his favourite walks is in the local park, only two minutes from their house. Tilsey Park is quite wooded. It's got some little areas where you can go off and there's quite a lot of bushes. You can tiptoe across streams. The walk also leads on to um, a much bigger walk all the way up to Sunning Wells. Come on. I know that Spenny can't get himself into too much mischief around here. He can go for a swim when it's hot. There's lots of little trails to do and the kids love coming here as well. But one day, whilst out for their usual walk, Spenny did get into some mischief, and it was to turn their world upside down. It was Saturday afternoon, and we had plans to go to the cinema, so we thought we'd walk Spencer quickly just before we went. Walked across to Tilsey Park. You gonna jump up? up? Let him off as I normally would, and went for our walk. Come on! We went over a little bridge and I whistled him and he didn't come. 
I couldn't hear him rustling in a bush. I couldn't hear him panting. With panic setting in, Kat called a friend to help her search. Went back to where I had originally lost him and I could hear this faint whimpering. howling noise coming from somewhere but as I moved the sound stopped so if I stood in a particular position I could hear it so I went down to the ditch and into the ditch I could hear his crying much more loudly had a little rummage around in all the undergrowth and found the opening to a pipe when I uncovered the pipe you could hear his howling and you could hear it coming from there called the emergency services and they could hear him as well. They tried with their cameras, they tried to find the end of the pipe, but we couldn't locate him. With night falling and the rescue services unable to locate Spencer, the decision was taken to suspend the search until the next day. But after a sleepless night, there was still no sign of Spencer. And after another day of searching, Kat turned to social media. We had got in contact with a local group on Facebook who kind of spread the word about a lost animal. And so lots of help was coming. We met with the fire brigade and they came down to try and help us locate the pipe because of course it was dark. So it was really tricky to see everything. Fearing the worst and knowing that time was not on their side, they were reluctantly about to call it a night for the second time. Never wanted to give up on him, but every which way I turned, a door was closing. There was no way of finding him, and by this time, he'd stopped making noise. Later, a desperate plea on social media brings last-minute hope from a special robot camera. They said, let me try and get your dog out, and I thought, if you want to come and try, you can come and try. I'm willing to try anything. High above the Alpine mountains in Switzerland, a thrill-seeking couple were trying hang gliding for the first time, but one of them quickly found themselves in trouble. As soon as my feet left the ground, I was supposed to fly above. I fell completely downward. Then he made a terrifying discovery. Quickly after that, I figured out that I wasn't attached to the hang glider. Chris was now left holding on for his life in midair. I was just looking to grab on to anything I can. Um, I had a, a grip on one of his uh, harness grabs. I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to get through this. At this point, the pilot had become aware of the unfolding emergency and took action. He grabbed at the back of my harness a couple times, and I just, you know, I, I kind of knew that it was just me holding on. The pilot had a dilemma. He needed to keep hold of Chris, but he also needed to steer both of them in an emergency landing. At first, when he was grabbing onto my harness, he was trying to fly with one hand. We made a quick right turn over some houses. I think because my weight was pulling down so hard on one side, I think he was having some difficulty trying to fly him. Chris suddenly became aware of his surroundings. That first time I looked down and I said, if I lose my grip, I'm a goner. I'm, I'm gonna, there's no way I'm gonna survive this or I'll, you know, be in really, really bad shape. So I just tried to concentrate with everything I had and just hold on. But once I got a hold of the bar that went across, which is the landing gear bar, um, I locked down with my left hand and, and my right hand, just looking to grab on to anything I can. Um, I had a, a grip on one of his uh, harness grabs, and uh, I was just trying to figure out how I'm going to, you know, get through this. The worst thoughts were flashing through his mind. I pictured one time in my head of me falling through the air. But he quickly resolved to fight. Right after that, I just decided that that's not gonna happen and held on as long as I could. Trying to stay positive, 
Chris couldn't dismiss the reality that they were now hurtling towards a town, searching for a safe place to land. My pilot was kind of trying to beeline it down to the ground as quickly as he could. T was telling me to hold on, to hang, to grab here. I just couldn't get a good grip with, so as the, the farther we were going, uh, the farther my right hand was getting down his shoulder, then his side, and then at the very end, I was holding onto the fabric of his pant leg on the back, so that really wasn't doing much for me. As Chris was starting to lose his grip, the pilot was his only hope. He was grabbing onto my safety harness and trying to hold on to me there. Uh, at one point, he had to let go totally because we were getting closer to the ground and he needed more control on the glider. Chris was struggling, but knew that a fall even from that height would be fatal. And we were getting closer to the ground and I was losing grip with my left hand. When I saw the ground coming up, we we're getting closer and closer, and uh, I think another five seconds, I would have let I would have let loose, no matter how high I was. Having almost made it to the safety of the grass, Chris's ordeal wasn't over yet. Once my feet scraped the ground, is when it pulled my grip free. I was still holding on when my feet did hit the ground. We were coming in probably, I would say, about 45 mile an hour. So it'd be like jumping out of a car. I kind of hit the ground hard and I tumbled a few times. I sat up and I looked down at my wrist and it was all bulged out and I knew it was broken. Meanwhile, Gail had landed and was unaware of Chris's terrifying ordeal. My flight was absolutely breathtaking. Really had the feeling of flying like a bird. My landing was perfect. I looked up to the sky to see where my husband was gonna land. My pilot told me that he had already landed. Once I did see him, as they pulled the van up, he was holding his arm, so I knew something was either fractured badly or, or broken badly. When they told me he was going to the hospital, um, yeah, I didn't know the extent of his injuries at that time. I was still calm at that point. Um, just trying to figure out what was going on. When they reached the hospital, Gail and Chris finally had a chance to talk. He told me that was the closest to death he had ever come. And I, I was like, why? And uh, that it was that point that he told me that he was not attached to the glider. In the emergency room, Chris's injuries became apparent. I, uh, when I impacted the ground, I, I broke the top of my bone in my arm outward because I impacted pretty hard. And uh, so I had to have a, a titanium plate and seven screws installed. And then uh, I had a torn bicep tendon on my left side because I was, I guess, holding on so long that I tore my bicep tendon. However, Chris knew he was lucky to have escaped with his life, knowing how close he'd come to facing death. We were taking x-rays. I was, you know, going to need surgery, but you know, I, 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 I was alive and I was getting taken care of, so I was just trying to keep positive. And his fighting spirit remained strong, despite the harrowing events of their first day on holiday. We thought about leaving and going home, but uh, Chris said, no, we're gonna, we're gonna finish out our trip and try to enjoy what we had left. I was extremely lucky that day. It was, you know, like winning the lottery uh, of life, I guess. Back in the waters off the coast of Georgia, USA, a mission is underway to rescue 24 crew members of a sinking cargo ship. But devastating news has reached the rescue team. Four crew members are still trapped on board. As the dawn breaks and the four missing crew remain trapped, the situation takes a horrifying turn when fire breaks out. I looked up at the side of the boat and it just started to billow smoke, just huge plumes of smoke. It felt like being in a movie at first, and just watching this smoke screen start to develop. We just happened to be downwind of it and very quickly, I realized that the smoke was starting to uh, come our way and was going to envelop us. 
Rescuing the remaining trapped crew members is now looking bleak. The sun was coming up, and to see that ship there on the horizon uh, laying on its side uh, just made my heart sink. And to know that there remained uh, four people inside that ship uh, made me feel even a little worse because the fire and smoke were really what kind of had us back off. Forced to retreat, the helicopters would need to wait until the fire eventually died down to make another approach and board the hull. A representative of the ship I was out there with us, an engineer. He said, let's give it a shot. Let's, let's go ahead and tap on the ship. And we were tapping on the ship, and that was probably 10, 30, or 11 in the morning. So nearly nine hours uh, plus after, and uh, we got no responses. Uh, we could hear cars uh, crashing uh, down inside every now and then, uh, but we did not hear tap backs. There's the chance that this rescue attempt has come too late, and the crew has already perished. But the team are not willing to give up, and their tenacity is about to pay off. That afternoon, crews out there continued to do it and started getting a reply. You would tap three times and you would get three back. You would tap four times and they would get four back. And to hear that they had made taps was just a game changer, really, for everyone. Uh, to know that, hey, we're not just dealing with a ship now. Uh, There's still, uh, still people alive. With renewed hope, engineers are drafted in to penetrate the thick metal hull in a bid to reach the men. Once again, the Coast Guard helicopter plays its part. Its pilot is Crystal Barnett. We had heard, hey, we have contact with the crew inside. And that was a huge release because it's like, oh, you have contact with the crew. Yes, and we, and they're, and they're, and we have contact with all four and they're all alive. So that was definitely like very elating, happy moment. Everybody was really relieved, like, wow, we're not gonna have to even cut into a different part of the ship. And they're confirming that all four people are alive in the same location, which is honestly kind of lucky that they're all there together and supporting each other in that r really horrible environment. But the relief is short-lived. The uh, time became critical because I'm getting the readings that we're getting from the space where the guys are at, and it's telling me, hey, there's a, there's a problem here uh, with the air uh, that, that can't support life. They must cut through the hole and fast, but first the helicopter needs to get close to the area to drop a salvage crew, and that isn't easy. We've definitely trained to land on small areas and structures like that, but definitely it's a unique place to land that it's an overturned vessel. We ended up doing five total landings. I kept power on the aircraft and I didn't put all of the weight down of the aircraft. So if something were to happen for some reason, we'd have an e easy out, just pick right back up and fly away. And once they cut into the ship, they realized that the air quality in the hull was so bad that it, it was creating a um, explosive hazard. So when they were cutting into the ship, they had to kind of keep that clear for the sparking hazard. And then also, knowing that the crew inside was breathing very toxic air, they immediately wanted to start blowing fresh air. And so a lot of the uh, equipment that we delivered to the boat was actually leaf blowers, the backpack style leaf blowers that you would use on your lawn. We delivered those so they could blow air into the hole that they cut so that the air would be fresher for the crew members trapped inside. As the day progresses, the team continue with their efforts and eventually create enough of a hole to access the ship. It was 140 degrees plus Fahrenheit. Uh, for those crews going in and out of out of uh, the hole that had been cut. Initially, it was just a scope hole to put something in there, confirm that there were people alive and they were in the right spot. Uh, and then uh, they were able to uh, drill a larger hole, which was a, about a three inch hole, and uh, and put uh, water through and be able to push air, clean air into the, uh, the space where the men were at. Finally, after 30 hours and the tireless efforts of the rescue teams, the remaining four crew members are free. Woo! Yeah!
when that uh, last guy came out and I asked all those guys to stand up there so I could get a picture and, and uh, I just said hey you guys made it uh, possible and uh, you've just made the best day of my career and and it truly was meanwhile back in the UK his family haven't given up hope for a safe return but time is running out I never wanted to give up on him but every which way I turned a door was closing a desperate cat turned once again to social media for help posting on a local site this resulted in more offers of assistance including one that surprised everyone I then had a message from Thames Water and they said let me try and get your dog out and I thought if you want to come and try you can come and try I'm willing to try anything and true to their word, they turned out that night sending their contractors. They had a camera that was on a robot that they put into the end of the pipe. As the robot was going through the pipe, we were all stood there watching the little TV screen in the back of the Thames Water van. And as it kept going through the pipe, it went for over 100 metres. And suddenly you saw Spencer's bottom. <laughs> You could see that he was shivering and shaking, which was the best news because it meant that he was alive. But although they could see Spencer, there was nothing they could do till daylight, and it meant another sleepless night for Kat. Hello, Jason Major speaking. The next morning, it was Jason Major, a fields operations specialist for Thames Water, who took the call from the team monitoring the pipe. Over there now. All right, cheers. I came to work on the Monday, I put my phone on, and the next thing I know, I've got an emergency call coming in telling me there's a, a dog stuck, stuck up a pipe. So I thought, oh, God, what do I do here? And I looked at the mapping. Um, I could see it actually wasn't one of our pipes. So I then had to go in and initiate exactly where the problem is, um, which was underneath one of the AstroTurf um, football pitches. Um, so I said, whatever we could do, we must get this dog out somehow. But to get Spencer out, they would need to dig up the pitch. And for that, they would need permission from the owners, Tisley Park. I arranged where we could dig away from where the dog was trapped in the hope that it was still alive. And then once we got the pipe exposed, we uh, cut our, our window. I wasn't sure whether the dog was alive or not because the camera footage, just, he was just not moving at all. I was invited in as they then removed the last part of the pipe. I then got down into the hole and my arm was just that little bit too short to reach Spencer. I had quite a long arm, so I spoke to Kat and uh, I said, has he got a tail? She said, well, he's got a little stump. So uh, I thought, great, I've got something I can sort of grab hold of. So uh, I managed to get my arm up the pipe and got hold of his tail. Once I started to, to give him a little pull, he had a little uh, moan, so I could tell he was alive. So I thought, thank God for that, you know. <laughs> it was great, you know, to see him alive and to hand him to Kat. She was so over the moon um, that he was OK and safe. And he was shaking and muddy and filthy, but he was very pleased to see me. It was the moment that I've been waiting for for three days. And a year later, Spencer has made a full recovery from his adventure. He is very much back to normal. You wouldn't think that he'd been through a stressful ordeal. The only thing I do is I don't leave him in the dark. I think that's more down to me. I think if I'd been in the dark for three days, I wouldn't want to be in the dark, so I always make sure I leave a light on at bedtime. A Florida couple were hang gliding on holiday in Switzerland when disaster struck. We were getting closer to the ground, and. I was losing grip. After an emergency landing, he was lucky to escape with just a broken wrist and a torn tendon. A couple of months later, he was finally able to watch his brush with death. I told the story before I saw the video to my friends and family, and I was trying to see how accurate my story was watching the video. And 
but it's still not an easy watch for Gail. It gives me anxiety, and um, just watching him switch his grip so many times and, and almost fall to his death was, you know, petrifying. Chris made a video of his experience, and it went around the world. Well, the video going viral was, it was a shock to me, and it, it was like four million views in two days. And Someone who saw the video and was keen to fulfill Chris's dream was Interlac and Tourism Manager Natalie Rothlin. I first saw Chris on social media, and it really impressed me uh, how he handled the whole situation. I contacted him because um, I wanted him to get another experience of Interlock and, and not to last it with the bad memories. But it was not without a few nerves. I was a little apprehensive about coming back and doing it again, but I knew that we probably needed to do this so we can really just move forward. A year later, and the day has arrived for the couple to return to Interlaken for their second hang gliding flight. <laughs> Hi, Chris, I'm Natalie. Oh, let's see. <laughs> How are you? Hello. Hi, I'm Natalie. Very good to meet nice you. Nice to meet you. Yeah. You're a bit nervous of your flight today? No, a little, a little bit. OK. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you will be landing at the... Yeah. 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 yeah we... Being back at the exact same takeoff location brought mixed feelings. It is quite surreal being back here to the same spot that we launched from before. Feeling good about it, and then, you know, the butterflies came in a little bit because I was looking down the same runway that I did the original time, and, you know, memories were coming back in my head, so. In my wildest dreams, I didn't think we would come back a year later, but uh, I'm here now, and it's going to be good. It was time to fight the nerves and take flight but not without a rigid check of his harness. We all checked that we were attached before we flew. Once we did take off, though, it was uh, absolutely fabulous. And we're gonna run on three, two, one, and go, and run, 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 off we go, all right. Really, really good to see him take off and just soar away like you're supposed to on a hang glider. I felt my harness tugging on my safety vest, so I was, I was quite sure that I was properly hooked up this time. Nerves turned into joy, definitely, when I took off. Just took it all in. The views were spectacular. It, it is extremely beautiful. You're effortlessly flying through the air. I'll do it again in a heartbeat. It was cool. Yeah, everybody needs to try that at least once. After successfully completing the flight, Chris and Gail's faith in adventure is now fully restored. We would definitely do it again. Yeah. <laughs> we may take we may take lessons now. You never know. <laughs> <laughs>